Lost Face by Jack London Lost Face It was the end. Subien Cow had traveled a long trail of bitterness and horror, homing like a dove for the capitals of Europe, and here, farther away than ever, in Russian America, the trail ceased. He sat in the snow, arms tied behind him, waiting the torture. He stared curiously before him at a huge Cossack, prone in the snow, moaning in his pain. The men had finished handling the giant and turned him over to the women. That they exceeded the fiendishness of the men, the man's cries attested. Subienkow looked on and shuddered. He was not afraid to die. He had carried his life too long in his hands, on that weary trail from Warsaw to Nulato, to shudder at mere dying. But he objected to the torture. It offended his soul, and this offense, in turn, was not due to the mere pain he must endure, but to the sorry spectacle the pain would make of him. He knew that he would pray and beg and entreat even as Big Ivan and the others that had gone before. This would not be nice. To pass out bravely and cleanly, with a smile and a jest. Ah, that would have been the way. But to lose control, to have his soul upset by the pangs of the flesh, to screech and gibber like an ape, to become the veriest beast, Oh, that was what was so terrible. There had been no chance to escape. From the beginning, when he dreamed the fiery dream of Poland's independence, he had become a puppet in the hands of fate. From the beginning, at Warsaw, at St. Petersburg, in the Siberian mines, in Kamchatka, on the crazy boats of the fur thieves. Fate had been driving him to this end. Without doubt, in the foundations of the world was graved this end for him. For him, who was so fine and sensitive, whose nerves scarcely sheltered under his skin, who was a dreamer and a poet and an artist. Before he was dreamed of, it had been determined that the quivering bundle of sensitiveness that constituted him should be doomed to live in raw and howling savagery and to die in this far land of night, in this dark place beyond the last boundaries of the world. He sighed, so that thing before him was Big Ivan. Big Ivan the giant, the man without nerves, the man of iron. The Cossack turned free booter of the seas, who was as phlegmatic as an ox, with a nervous system so low that what was pain to ordinary men was scarce a tickle to him. Well, well, trust these Nilato Indians to find Big Ivan's nerves and trace them to the roots of his quivering soul. They were certainly doing it. It was inconceivable that a man could suffer so much and yet live. 
Big Ivan was paying for his low order of nerves. Already he had lasted twice as long as any of the others. Subienkow felt that he could not stand the Cossack sufferings much longer. Why didn't Ivan die? He would go mad if that screaming didn't cease. But when it did cease, his turn would come. And there was Yakaga awaiting him too, grinning at him even now in anticipation. Yakaga, whom only last week he had kicked out of the fort, and upon whose face he had laid the lash of his dog whip. Yakaga would attend to him. Doubtlessly, Yakaga was saving for him more refined tortures, more exquisite, nerve-wracking. <sighs> oh, that must have been a good one from the way Ivan screamed. The squaws bending over him stepped back with laughter and clapping of hands. Subienkow saw the monstrous thing that had been perpetrated and began to laugh hysterically. The Indians looked at him in wonderment that he should laugh, but Subienkow could not stop. This would never do. He controlled himself, the spasmodic twitching slowly dying away. He strove to think of other things and began reading back in his own life. He remembered his mother and his father and the little spotted pony and the French tutor who had taught him dancing and sneaked him an old worn copy of Voltaire. Once more he saw Paris and dreary London and gay Vienna and Rome, and once more he saw that wild group of youths who had dreamed, even as he, the dream of an independent Poland with a king of Poland on the throne at Warsaw. Ah, there it was that the long trail began. Well, he had lasted longest. One by one, beginning with the two, executed at St. Petersburg, he took up the count of the passing of those brave spirits. Here, one had been beaten to death by a jailer, and there, on that blood-stained highway of the exiles, where they had marched for endless months, beaten and maltreated by their Cossack guards, another had dropped by the way. Always it had been savagery, brutal, bestial savagery. They had died of fever, in the mines, under the knout. The last two had died after the escape, in the battle with the Cossacks, and he alone had won to Kamchatka with the stolen papers and the money of a traveler he had left lying in the snow. It had been nothing but savagery. All the years, with his heart in studios and theaters and courts, he had been hemmed in by savagery. He had purchased his life with blood. Everybody had killed. He had killed that traveler for his passports. He had proved that he was a man of parts by dueling with two Russian officers on a single day. He had had to prove himself in order to win to a place among the fur thieves. He had had to win to that place. Behind him lay the thousand years long road across all Siberia and Russia. He could not escape that way. The only way was ahead, 
across the dark and icy sea of Bering to Alaska. The way had led from savagery to deeper savagery. On the scurvy, rotten ships of the fur thieves, out of food and out of water, buffeted by the indeterminable storms of that stormy sea, men had become animals. Thrice he had sailed east from Kamchatka, and thrice, after all manner of hardship and suffering, the survivors had come back to Kamchatka. There had been no outlet for escape, and he could not go back the way he had come, for the mines and the knout awaited him. Again, the fourth and last time he had sailed east, he had been with those who first found the fabled Seal Islands. But he had not returned with them to share the wealth of furs in the mad orgies of Kamchatka. He had sworn never to go back. He knew that to win to those dear capitals of Europe he must go on. So he had changed ships and remained in the dark new land. His comrades were Slovenian hunters and Russian adventurers, Mongols and Tartars and Siberian aborigines, and through the savages of the new world they had cut a path of blood. They had massacred whole villages that refused to furnish the fur tribute. And they, in turn, had been massacred by ship's companies. He, with one fin, had been the sole survivor of such a company. They had spent a winter of solitude and starvation on a lonely Aleutian Isle, and their rescue in the spring by another fur ship had been one chance in a thousand. But always the terrible savagery had hemmed him in, passing from ship to ship, and ever refusing to return, he had come to the ship that explored south. All down the Alaska coast, they had encountered nothing but hosts of savages. Every anchorage among the beetling islands or under the frowning cliffs of the mainland had meant a battle or a storm. Either the gales blew threatening destruction, or the war canoes came off, manned by howling natives with the war paint on their faces, who came to learn the bloody virtues of the sea rover's gunpowder. South, south they had coasted, clear to the mythland of California. Here, it was said, were Spanish adventurers who had fought their way up from Mexico. He had hopes of those Spanish adventurers. Escaping to them, the rest would have been easy. A year or two, what did it matter more or less? And he would win to Mexico, then a ship, and Europe would be his. But they had met no Spaniards. Only had they encountered the same impregnable wall of savagery, the denizens of the confines of the world, painted for war, had driven them back from the shores. At last, when one boat was cut off and every man killed, the commander had abandoned the quest and sailed back to the north. The years had passed. He had served under Tebenkoff when Mike Levesky's redoubt was built. He had spent two years in the Kaskakwim country. Two summers, in the month of June, he had managed to be at the head of Katsabu Sound. Here, at this time, the tribes assembled for barter. 
Here were to be found spotted deerskins from Siberia, ivory from the Diomedes, walrus skins from the shores of the Arctic, strange stone lamps passing in trade from tribe to tribe, no one knew whence, and once a hunting knife of English make. And here, Subienkow knew, was the school in which to learn geography, for he met Eskimos from Norton Sound, from King Island and St. Lawrence Island, from Cape Prince of Wales and Point Barrow. Such places had other names, and their distances were measured in days. It was a vast region these trading savages came from, and a vaster region from which, by repeated trade, their stone lamps and that steel knife had come. Subien cow bullied and cajoled and bribed. Every far journeyer or strange tribesman was brought before him. Perils unaccountable and unthinkable were mentioned as well as wild beasts, hostile tribes, impenetrable forests, and mighty mountain ranges. But always from beyond came the rumor and the tale of white-skinned men, blue of eye and fair of hair, who fought like devils and who sought always for furs. They were to the east, far, far to the east. No one had seen them. It was the word that had been passed along. It was a hard school. One could not learn geography very well through the medium of strange dialects from dark minds that mingled fact and fable and that measured distances by sleeps that varied according to the difficulty of the going. But at last came the whisper that gave Subienkau courage. In the east lay a great river where were these blue-eyed men. The river was called the Yukon. South of Michaelovsky's redoubt emptied another great river, which the Russians knew as the Quickpick. These two rivers were one, ran the whisper. Subienkow returned to Michaelovsky. For a year he urged an expedition up the Quickpick. Then arose Malakoff, the Russian half-breed to lead the wildest and most ferocious of the hell's broth of mongrel adventurers who had crossed from Kamchatka. Subienkow was his lieutenant. They threaded the mazes of the great delta of the Quickpick, picked up the first low hills on the northern bank, and for half a thousand miles, in skin canoes loaded to the gunnels with trade goods and ammunition, fought their way against the five-knot current of a river that ran from two to ten miles wide in a channel many fathoms deep. Melikov decided to build the fort at Nulato. Subienko urged to go farther, but he quickly reconciled himself to Nulato. The long winter was coming. It would be better to wait. Early the following summer, when the ice was gone, he would disappear up the Quickpeck and work his way to the Hudson Bay Company's posts. Malikoff had never heard the whisper that the Quickpeck was the Yukon, and Subienko did not tell him. Came the building of the fort. It was enforced labor. The tiered walls of logs arose to the sighs and groans of the Nulato Indians. The lash was laid upon their backs, and it was the iron hand of the freebooters of the sea that laid on the lash. There were Indians that ran away, and when they were caught, 
they were brought back and spread eagled before the fort where they and their tribe learned the efficacy of the knout. Two died under it. Others were injured for life, and the rest took the lesson to heart and ran away no more. The snow was flying ere the fort was finished, and then it was the time for furs. A heavy tribute was laid upon the tribe. Blows and lashings continued, and that the tribute should be paid The women and children were held as hostages and treated with the barbarity that only the fur thieves knew. Well, it had been a sowing of blood, and now was come the harvest. The fort was gone. In the light of its burning, half the fur thieves had been cut down. The other half had passed under the torture. Only Subien Cow remained. Or Subien Cow and Big Ivan, if that whimpering, moaning thing in the snow could be called Big Ivan. Subien Cow caught Yakaga grinning at him. There was no gainsaying Yakaga. The mark of the lash was still on his face. After all, Subienko could not blame him, but he disliked the thought of what Yakaga would do to him. He thought of appealing to Makama, the head chief, but his judgment told him that such appeal was useless. Then, too, he thought of bursting his bonds and dying fighting. Such an end would be quick, but he could not break his bonds. Caribou thongs were stronger than he. Still devising, another thought came to him. He signed for Makama, and that an interpreter who knew the coast dialect should be brought. Oh, Makamak, he said, I am not mind to die. I am a great man, and it were foolishness for me to die. In truth, I shall not die. I am not like these other carrion. He looked at the moaning thing that had once been Big Ivan and stirred it contemptuously with his toe. I am too wise to die. Behold, I have a great medicine. I alone know this medicine. Since I am not going to die, I shall exchange this medicine with you. What is this medicine? Makama demanded. It is a strange medicine. Subien Kao debated with himself for a moment, as if loath to part with the secret. I will tell you a little bit of this medicine, rubbed on the skin, makes the skin hard like a rock, hard like iron, so that no cutting weapon can cut it. The strongest blow of a cutting weapon is a vain thing against it. A bone knife becomes like a piece of mud, and it will turn the edge of the iron knives we have brought among you. What will you give me for the secret of the medicine? I'll give you your life. Makama made answer through the interpreter. Subian Kao laughed scornfully. And you shall be a slave in my house until you die. <laughs> the poor laughed more scornfully. Untie my hands and feet and let us talk, he said. 
the chief made the sign, and when he was loosed, Su Bien Kao rolled a cigarette and lighted it. This is foolish talk, said Makama. There is no such medicine. It cannot be. Us cutting edge is stronger than any medicine. The chief was incredulous, and yet he wavered. He had seen too many deviltries of fur thieves that worked. He could not wholly doubt. I will give you your life, but you shall not be a slave, he announced. <laughs> More than that! Subian Cow played his game as coolly as if he were bartering for a fox skin. It is a very great medicine. It has saved my life many times. I want a sled and dogs and six of your hunters to travel with me down the river and give me safety to one day's sleep from my Klaveski's readout. You must live here and teach us all of your deviltries, was the reply. Subienkow shrugged his shoulders and remained silent. He blew cigarette smoke out on the icy air and curiously regarded what remained of the big Cossack. That scar, Bakuma said suddenly, pointing to the pole's neck where a livid mark advertised the slash of a knife in a Kamchatkan brow. The medicine is not good. The cutting edge was stronger than the medicine. It was a strong man that drove the stroke, Subian Cow considered. Stronger than you. Stronger than your strongest hunter. Stronger than he. Again, with the toe of his moccasin, he touched the Cossack, a grisly spectacle, no longer conscious, yet in whose dismembered body the pain-wracked life clung and was loath to go. Also, the medicine was weak. For at that place there were no berries of a certain kind. Of which I see you have plenty in this country. The medicine here will be strong. I will let you go down river, said Makabuk. And the sled and the dogs and the six hunters to give you safety shall be yours. You are slow was the cool rejoinder. You have committed an offense against my medicine, in that you did not at once accept my terms. Behold, I now demand more. I want one hundred beaver skins, Makamuk sneered. I want one hundred pounds of dried fish. Makama nodded, for fish were plentiful and cheap. I want two sleds, one for me and one for my furs and fish. And my rifle must be returned to me, if you do not like the price. In a little while, the price will grow. Yakago whispered to the chief. But how can I know your medicine is true medicine? Makama asked. It is very easy. First, I shall go into the woods. Again, Yakago whispered to Makama, who made a suspicious descent. You can send twenty hunters with me. Subienka went on. You see, 
I must get the berries and the roots with which to make the medicine. Then, when you have brought the two sleds and loaded on them the fish and the beaver skins and the rifle, and when you have told off the six hunters who will go with me, then, when all this is ready, I will rub the medicine on my neck, so, and lay my neck there on that log. Then, can your strongest hunter take the axe and strike three times on my neck? You yourself can strike the three times. Makama stood with gaping mouth, drinking in this latest and most wonderful magic of the fur thieves. But first, the pole added hastily, between each blow, I must put on fresh medicine. The axe is heavy and sharp, and I want no mistakes. All that you have asked shall be yours. Makama cried in a rush of acceptance. Proceed to make your medicine. Subien Kao concealed his elation. He was playing a desperate game, and there must be no slips. He spoke arrogantly. You have been slow. My medicine is offended. To make the offense clean, you must give me your daughter. He pointed to the girl, an unwholesome creature, with a cast in one eye and a bristling wolf tooth. Makama was angry, but the pole remained imperturbable, rolling another cigarette. Make haste, he threatened. If you are not quick, I shall demand yet more. In the silence that followed, the dreary Northland scene faded before him, and he saw once more his native land and France. And once, as he glanced at the wolf-toothed girl, he remembered another girl, a singer and a dancer whom he had known when first as a youth he came to Paris. What do you want with a girl? Macamuck asked. To go down the river with me. Subien Kao glanced over her critically. She will make a good wife, and it is an honor, worthy of my medicine, to be married to your blood. Again he remembered the singer and dancer, and hummed aloud a song she had taught him. He lived the old life over, but in a detached, impersonal sort of way, looking at the memory pictures of his own life as if they were pictures in a book of anybody's life. The chief's voice, abruptly breaking the silence, startled him. It shall be done, said Makama. The girl shall go down the river with you. But be it understood that I myself strike the three blows with the axe on your neck. But each time... I shall put on the medicine, Subienkow answered with a show of ill-concealed anxiety. You shall put the medicine on between each blow. Here are the hunters who shall see you do not escape. Go into the forest and gather your medicine. Makama had been convinced of the worth of the medicine by the pole's rapacity. Surely. Nothing less than the greatest of medicines could enable a man in the shadow of death to stand up and drive an old woman's bargain. Besides, whispered Yakaga when the pole, with his guard, had disappeared among the spruce trees. When you have learned the medicine, you can easily destroy him. But how can I destroy him? Makama argued. His medicine will not let me destroy him. There will be some part 
where he has not rubbed the medicine, was Yakaga's reply. We will destroy him through that part. It may be his ears. Very well. We will thrust a spear in one ear and out the other. Or it may be his eyes. Surely the medicine will be much too strong to rub on his eyes. The chief nodded. You are wise, Yakaga. If he possesses no other devil things, we will then destroy him. Subien Kao did not waste time in gathering the ingredients for his medicine. He selected whatever came to hand, such as spruce needles, the inner bark of the willow, a strip of birch bark, and a quantity of moss berries, which he made the hunters dig up for him from beneath the snow. A few frozen roots completed his supply, and he led the way back to camp. Makama and Yakaga crouched beside him, noting the quantities and kinds of the ingredients he dropped into the pot of boiling water. You must be careful that the moss berries go in first, he explained. And, uh, oh, oh yes, one other thing. The finger of a man. Here, Yakaga, let me cut off your finger. But Yakaga put his hands behind him and scowled. Just a small finger, Subienko pleaded. Yakaga, give him your finger, Makamuk commanded. There be plenty of fingers lying around. Yakaga grunted, indicating the human wreckage in the snow of the score of persons who had been tortured to death. It must be the finger of a live man, the pole objected. Then shall you have the finger of a live man. Yakaga strode over to the Cossack and sliced off a finger. He is not yet dead he announced, flinging the bloody trophy in the snow at the pole's feet. Also, it is a good finger, because it is large. Subien Kao dropped it into the fire under the pot and began to sing. It was a French love song that with great solemnity he sang into the brew. Without these words I utter into it. The medicine is worthless, he explained. The words are the chiefest strength of it. Behold, it is ready. Name the words slowly that I may know them, Makama commanded. Not until after the test. Then the axe flies back three times. Times from my neck. Then will I give you the secret of the verts. But if the medicine is not good medicine, Makama queried anxiously. Subi and Kao turned upon him wrathfully. My medicine is always good. However, if it is not good, then do by me as you have done to the others. Cut me up a bit at a time, even as you have cut him up. He pointed to the Cossack. The medicine is now cool. Thus I rub it on my neck, saying tis for their medicine. With great gravity, he slowly intoned a line of the Marseillaise, at the same time rubbing the villainous brew thoroughly into his neck. An outcry interrupted his play-acting. The giant Cossack, with a last resurgence of his tremendous vitality, had arisen to his knees. Laughter and cries of surprise and applause arose from the Dulados as Big Ivan began flinging himself about in the snow with mighty spasms. Subienko was made sick by the sight but he mastered his qualms and made believe to be angry. This will not do, he said. Finish him, and then we will make the test. Here, you, Yakaga, 
see that his noise ceases. While this was being done, Subienkow turned to Makamuk. And remember, you are to strike hard. This is not baby work. Here, take the axe and strike the log, so I can see you strike like a man. Makama obeyed, striking twice, precisely and with vigor, cutting out a large chip. It is well. Subienkow looked about him at the circle of savage faces that somehow seemed to symbolize the wall of savagery that had hemmed him about ever since the Tsar's police had first arrested him in Warsaw. Take your axe, Nekana, and stand so. I shall lie down. When I raise my hand, strike, and strike with all your might. And be careful that no one stands behind you. The medicine is good, and the axe may bounce from off my neck and right out of your hands. He looked at the two sleds with dogs in harness loaded with furs and fish. His rifle lay on top of the beaver skins. The six hunters who were to act as his guards stood by the sleds. There is the girl, the pole demanded. Bring her up to the sleds before the test goes on. When this had been carried out, Subienkow lay down in the snow, resting his head on the log like a tired child about to sleep. He had lived so many dreary years that he was indeed tired. I laugh at you and your strength, O Makamuk, he said. Strike, and strike hard. He lifted his hand. Makamuk swung the axe. A broad axe for the squaring of logs. The bright steel flashed through the frosty air, poised for a perceptible instant above Makamuk's head, then descended upon Subienkow's bare neck, clear through flesh and bone. It cut its way, biting deeply into the log beneath. The amazed savages saw the head bounce a yard away from the blood-spouting trunk. There was great bewilderment and silence while slowly it began to dawn in their minds that there had been no medicine. The fur thief had outwitted them alone. Of all their prisoners, he had escaped the torture. That had been the stake for which he played. A great roar of laughter went up. Makamuk bowed his head in shame. The fur thief had fooled him. He had lost face before all his people. Still, they continued to roar out their laughter. Makamuk turned and with bowed head stalked away. He knew that thenceforth he would be no longer known as Makamuk. He would be lost face. The record of his shame would be with him until he died, and whenever the tribes gathered in the spring for the salmon, or in the summer for the trading, the story would pass back and forth across the campfires of how the fur thief died peaceably at a single stroke by the hand of Lost Face. Who was Lost Face? He could hear, in anticipation, some insolent young buck demand. Oh, Lost Face would be the answer. He who once was Makamuk in the days before he cut off the fur thief's head. End of section one. Read by Keith Marone.